Okay, well, it looks like our attendee uh, list has stabilized, so let's begin. Uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Silver, and this is Information Please. Information Please is a panel show that is based on an old radio show that was hosted by Clifton Fadiman in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, the basic idea is that I, as your moderator, will ask a series of questions to the panels, uh, the panelists. The panelists get to work together to try to come up with the answers. Now, if it's a question that was sent in by an audience member, and you can send in questions to me uh, at uh, infopleasesf at gmail.com, I'm putting that into the um, chat box, um, I may wind up using them at a future uh, iteration of Information Please. Um, if I do use one of your questions in a show, uh, you will receive an advanced reader copy of a book sent to you. If you manage to stump the panel, you will receive not only the copy of an advanced reader copy, but you will also get a year subscription to Amazing Stories, courtesy of Steve Davidson. So that being said, I'm actually going to let my panel of experts here introduce themselves, starting with Bill Higgins, who's actually done this before, so he knows what to expect. Uh, yes, and yet I really don't know what to expect. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Bill Higgins. I am a uh, a physicist and a longtime Chicago area fan uh, and uh, a lover of science fiction and its history. Uh, and I, I guess I, I, I work in radiation safety at Fermilab, uh, the particle accelerator lab outside Chicago, but I'm not speaking for Fermilab here. Okay, and Cap? Hi, I'm Kat Rambo. I am a Seattle-based writer and editor. I just put out in The Last Trump Shall Sound, uh, which I co-wrote with Harry Turtledove and James Morrow. Oh, Stephen's got his copy. It's got a great cover. I love that cover. Um, and I don't really know that I'm an expert on anything, except I am a Maryland certified master gardener. So uh, I hope we have lots of gardening questions. Okay, let me write up some gardening questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scott? Oh, I thought you wanted experts to introduce themselves. <laughs> I was waiting for someone else. Uh, I'm Scott. I've been attending conventions for, oh, almost 50 years. My first convention when I was 15. Yeah, I've, I've attended a live, non-virtual, face-to-face -face convention every year until this one. And as I put out earlier, this may be the most embarrassing panel of all the ones I've been on uh, in that an entire career of hundreds of panels because we are going to get stumped and humiliated and embarrassed and show that all the things you thought we knew we didn't actually know. Uh, but separate from that, I uh, started my career in comic books, working for Marvel in the Marvel bullpen, also wrote for DC, moved on to selling my science fiction and fantasy, have about 100 stories I've published, new short story collection, Things That Never Happened, just out from Cemetery Dance Press, and I'm the host of the Eating the Fantastic podcast, 128 episodes so far, in which I take writers, editors, agents, artists out for a meal, and you get to eavesdrop on what we're doing. So you can find that on Apple Podcasts. So where are we going for dinner after this, uh, Scott? The ether. Oh, okay. I, I hear the they have a great, I hear they have great atmosphere philosophy. there. And Julie. Hi, yes, Trev and I. Um, I am uh, a photobiologist, uh, gardener, <laughs> camper. I'm, I'm looking forward to all these kinds of questions. Um, I write science fiction and fantasy published by DAW. And these are my two latest babies that are at just at, well, this one uh, just won an award. And this one just came out in August. Thank you. So keeping busy. Uh, I have consumed a great deal of science fiction throughout my life. I love it dearly. And I, my ability to remember the minutiae is very, very small. 
I'm going to give it a go. Okay, well, but you know, here's the great thing about this this panel. It is a group effort. It's true. So, so <laughs> you're allowed to play off each other. You're allowed to discuss. And, you know, if you're trying to come up with something, you may say something that sparks Kat to realize what the answer is or... You know, you can describe something in a way that Scott is able to, to feed you what the answers are, so on. And as long as one of the four of you gets it right, you're golden. So okay. we're meant to have a public discussion about this before we vote on the correct answer? Exactly. Oh. Exactly. Uh, therefore, none of you are actually being put on the spot. Well, you are, but collectively. Uh, plus, we're not the ones giving out the prizes. Our I, I, only goal I, I, is to be entertaining. In your my goal, opinion. your goal is to be entertaining, and with luck, something correct. So let us begin. Um, I'm looking for five authors who were born in non-anglophone countries. Do they have to be speculative fiction authors? <laughs> For, for the purposes of this, we're going to go with, yes, speculative fiction authors. Oh, so Terry Pratchett would count? No, you said non-Anglo. Non-Anglo. Well, well, how about... If you were uh, born in Wales, maybe. Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. Ooh, that's two. Two, I would add. <laughs> Let's start with Jules Verne and add Cyrano uh, de Bergerac. Nice. And that, well, that's, and let's that's get cool. a little more recent. How about uh, Inajim and Prasad from Singapore? Ooh, nice one. And a former guest of the show, Plug Plug. Okay. And let's, let's throw in the author of the three-body problem for a bonus point. Okay, so that's Shishin Liu. Ooh, we're good. Okay, great. So see how easy it is? See, why were you so so dour about this, Scott? <laughs> You're still like, oh, doom is coming. It's I just... aim for that steamroller. <laughs> no, it'll be something he'll know. He's going to ask that we're supposed to know, and people will say, you should have known that one. I know it's coming. Okay, That's so why he does this. <laughs> that will that will happen. Just roll with it. Okay. So since Scott was busy talking about eating and food, uh -oh. I would like to know the name of all five major monster cereals. So Count Chocula. Count Chocula. Count Chocula. Frankenberry. Frankenberry. Boo Berry. Boo Berry. There are monster cereals. <laughs> <laughs> they, they may not have gotten north of the border, Julie. Okay. <laughs> so I, I reckon Captain Crunch does not. Well, Captain Crunch is He's monstrous. very scary. He really is. <laughs> He's a monstrous representation of the patriarchy uh, cast as a pirate. Captain He's Crunch been. has been chasing that white whale all those years. And, you know, it's It's a horrifying. monster. Oh, come on. Captain Crunch was created by the guy who created Rocky and Bullwinkle. How horrible can he be? So are they all related? Are they all part of, like, the same, like, like, they're part of the same line from General uh, General Mills, I believe. Have we, have, we only have four, though. We didn't need one more. Oh, no, you, you have, have three. Four? You have three. three. No, I have three. So there's got to be a werewolf one. Right? There is a werewolf, werewolf one. Is there a werewolf? Is there? There does, but what's it called? I've never eaten it. Werewolf. Two really? before midnight? <laughs> Harry. <and Wolf>. <laughs> <laughs> is but there the a werewolf will only give us one more, so we have to have the other. We've gone on to Dracula, Frankenstein. Like, like, what are the classic? There's got to be a ghost one in there. Well, Boo Berry is the ghost Boo one. Oh, that's right. Boo Berry's the yeah. ghost. Quisp and Quake don't count because they're science fictional. <laughs> they were also created by the guy who created Rocky and Bullwinkle. Like, like how long did these alternate monster serials exist on the shelf? Um, the werewolf one was around for a while. Uh, the other one kind of comes and goes they'll bring it out every few years you know for a one year thing pardon Cheerios, they never die so, um, okay, so, so the, the other two were uh, Lon Chaney crisps were, were fruit brute was the werewolf one fruit? so so cat did figure out that it was a werewolf so I'm going to give you a point for that uh, and then fruity yummy mummy oh which That's I think is probably as awful as it sounds yeah. How can it? I, I, I mean, and I'm going to argue Captain Crunch still more monstrous. <laughs> and and toucans are scary, also. So the toucan was. That. Well, the monstrous know, beak. Well, so, so are like talking bears and lions. I mean, you know, and rabbits. It, oh. It's just a serial aisle full of terror. See, I, I'm currently reading Jasper Ford's new book, which is called The Constant Rabbit. So, it's talking about scary rabbits. <gasps> yeah. Um. 
staying on monsters a little while longer. Um, uh, yes, Jay Ward did create Rocky Bullwinkle, Captain Crunch, and uh, Quisp and Quake. Um, okay. I'm looking, f aside from the movie Frankenstein, can you name three other universal Frank movies that Frankenstein appeared in? Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. That is one of them. Okay, and The Bride of Frankenstein. That is another one. There was a time. Was well, there? The Son of Frankenstein. And that was a third one, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, Boris Karloff appeared in Bride and Son of Frankenstein, and Glenn Strange played uh, the monster in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. And, and who played the monster in Andy Warhol's Frankenstein? I could not tell you offhand. Nice one. You stumped him. Who was it, Scott? <laughs> Oh, I think his name something to stereo. I can't remember his full name. So but, uh, uh, a year or so ago, uh, my wife and my mother-in-law and I went to see an Andy Warhol exhibit that was here in Chicago at the Art Institute, and they had one of his films playing in a theater. And they said, "Oh, let's go in and watch it." I said, "We'll go in, but you're not going to want to stay in for more than about thirty, forty-five seconds." I was being optimistic about how long they would want to stay in there. Yeah. They, I, we were out in about 15 seconds. It was Andy Warhol is just does weird stuff. Um, okay. I'm looking for names of space shuttles. Now I, I know you know them, but I'm looking for specific ones. So tell me a space shuttle uh, that was launched with painted a, a painted external fuel tank. Galileo? Columbia. Columbia. Oh. Oh, not science fiction. This, this is the Rockwell shuttle he's talking about. So, yeah, this is real space shuttle. Not, um, not a Star Trek shuttle. Okay, uh, what was a space shuttle? What was the space shuttle that made the last flight? Atlantis. Atlantis is correct. Uh, a space shuttle that never flew in space. Enterprise. Okay, what about one that never flew? The best article in Alabama. Which is called what? Uh, Dud? Um, <laughs> it was called I, the Pathfinder. The Pathfinder, yeah. And what space shuttle was made with spare parts? Endeavor? Endeavor. Okay. Um, because we're all science fiction authors or fans, um, we're going to go with some puns. <laughs> so um, we know that when you are attending a convention, the word con frequently comes into play in the name of the convention. Okay. So be thinking in terms of puns. So what would you call a convention that takes place in Minas Tirith? Gone con? Condor? What was that, Kat? Uh, Condor. Condor, Yes. Okay, and what about one uh, in Venice? Condola. Condola, yes. Oh. My, my daughter has also suggested that uh, Canal would be acceptable for that one. Um, a convention at a campground. Campground. I know real cons call things like fire con. How about, uh, I don't know, consular? Let's see. It wouldn't be Conestoga. That's probably the answer to one you haven't asked yet. But, uh, uh, it could be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> then we get that one. <laughs> so, although, frankly, the one that Conestoga responds to, I had come up with Condorosa for that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But you're not really thinking about summer camp. You're thinking about you know, a vacation camping? camp, right? Well, when, when you camp, what do you sleep in? Conabago. Conabago, I think, works. <laughs> so I was, I was thinking content. Content. <laughs> content. Uh, content. content. Okay, we'll, we'll move on from that category. Um, we're just warming up. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. we're not out of puns yet. Oh, I have other pun ones. Uh, I'm sure you do. Um, Lowest form of humor. Why have we gone to this? Okay. Um, One of the finest minds in science fiction. And, and, and <laughs> thinking so hard. <laughs> I, I really think that, that putting together puns goes along with, with science fiction. There's something wrong with all of us. 
Oh, God. Now we've got Sanctuary Moon. Track one is in on it. Thank, thank you, Karen. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you the name of dragons. And I would like to know what author wrote about that dragon. Okay? So, Jim Eckert. Oh, uh, uh, George Dixon? George O. Dixon? Dragon of the George? Yeah, Gordy Dixon. Um, Ruth. Oh, Anne McCaffrey. Okay. Ryath. Come on, Scott. You know your dragons. <laughs> now he says Ryath. I'm thinking uh, Cthulhu rather than... Uh... <laughs> That's Rilla. I know. Ryath. Okay. Um... <laughs> can we have it used? You never have heard it said aloud. Yes, can you use it in a sentence? <laughs> uh, yes, there is an author who wrote about a dragon named Ryan. What is the author's name? Well done, Stephen. <laughs> well played, indeed. Ryath. Ryath. Uh, that would be Raymond Feist. Oh. Raymond Feist. Oh, Raymond Feist. And Gleep. Uh, Bob Asprin? Bob Asprin, yes. Okay, uh, moving on. I would like three pseudonyms used by Henry Cutner. Lewis Paget. Lewis Paget. Oh, I should know these. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of them. Bob. <laughs> what was that? Bob. <laughs> it like probably that. was at some point. <laughs> Lawrence O'Donnell? Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell is another one. Very good. <laughs> Sorry. See all more, anybody? Henry, Henry Cutner wrote under the name C.L. Moore? They wrote everything no, they together. wrote together, so... Oh, and, and it was hard to tell, but um, the complete list is actually rather lengthy. Well, some oh. of the works published as Henry Cutner were not written by Henry Cutner. And, so right. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they explained that they just left the paper in the typewriter, and whoever was walking by and had an idea would continue it. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So, uh, which author has also published using the name Kate Elliott? And I know this. I should know this. Is Naomi Novik? No. See, this is where talking to each other might help, you know. Oh, God. Kate Elliott. Kate okay. Elliott. Author Kate Elliott? Uh, guys, you Kate remember Elliott, the Kate interview Elliott. in Locus where she explained why it happened. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I just can't ever quite remember that pair of names. Uh, it's a well-known tale. Uh, what did Kate Elliott publish? Do we get any hints there? Um, I would have to actually look up what she published under her original okay. name. Um, mm -hmm. uh, her original name was Alice Rasmussen. Yes, I should know uh, that. Okay. Uh, how we call her when we see her. We call her Alice. Right. How about Robin Hobb? Oh, Megan Lindholm. Yes. And K.J. Parker. Wait, K.J. Parker. Well, K.J. Parker is a best-selling writer under their other name, correct? They are K.J. Parker is a best-selling writer under both names. Yes. And has won the World Fantasy Award under the K.J. Parker name. Yes. Ooh. And... Under the original name, K.J. Parker is best known for humorous fantasy. And is British. Terry Pratchett? Nope. Okay. Uh, Tom Holt. Tom Holt. I did not I know this. Expect yeah. question taller. <laughs> you were expecting the question to be taller? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to try something new here. Um, I haven't done this before. 
uh, partly because it's not easy to do in real life. Um, I'm going to share my screen and you will see uh, book co cover art. And for each piece of cover art, I am looking for the, um, the name of the artist. Okay. I'm so bad at this. It's so, okay. I'm we're working together. Ah. I love this kind of thing. Okay. So here's the first piece of art. Oh, 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 oh. Jody Lynn Nye? Uh, no, close. I don't think she paints. You have the first name right. Is it Bob Eggleton? No. Not if Jody's the first name. Jody. Oh. Wait, I'm sorry. No, sorry. Not Jody. Different yeah. person. Sorry. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. The style, though, is very similar. Oh, it's very pretty. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, goodness. Uh, this no. person was a guest of honor at a uh, relatively recent Worldcon. Yes. Scott, you were there. <laughs> I well, I, I it's certainly not John Picaccio, but uh, uh this is Canuco Craft. Oh uh, yes. Canuco Craft. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I should know that. Frazetta. That Tom Lockwood. Not Frazetta, not Lockwood. No. Oh God. Uh, Michael Whalen. It is Michael Whalen. Oh, it is one of his Elric right covers. Right to paint like Frazetta. <laughs> Boris Vallejo. Not Boris Vallejo. Okay. Uh, um, um, Julie Palumbo. Not what? Julie either. What, Bill? Rowena Morrow, maybe? It is Rowena Morrow. Nice. Good eye. That's Robert Eggleton, isn't it? That is Bob Eggleton. He has a thing with waves and clouds. That's what gives him. He does have a lovely way with it. Yeah. You wait for Godzilla to come in. Ooh. That's pretty. Um, uh, Ron Wolotsky? It is not Ron Wolotsky. Guy who does a lot uh, of the Mercedes uh, Lackey Enchanters of London covers. Ooh, I, okay. I think this art artist does do a lot with Misty Lackey, yes. Not Larry Dixon. <laughs> no. He also does a lot with Misty Lackey, but no. He does look yes. <laughs> uh, this is Jody Lee. Oh. Uh, and the last one. Say the name again. I, it got lost in my audio here. Uh, Jody Lee. Jody A. Lee. Jody Lee. Yeah. Okay. And the last one. Ooh, without people, it's hard to tell. <laughs> mm. I almost want to say um, Jean-Pierre Nomen, just because I've worked with him and he does these amazing uh, figures. But uh... Uh, He does do very nice work. Uh, Bill, I'll give you a hint. Uh, he was one of my guests of honor at WindyCon 42. Oh, it's not Jim Burns, is it? It is not Jim Burns, no. I can see it, it though. An airbrush. Uh, this is uh, a, a British off, uh, artist, uh, Christopher Moore. Christopher Moore, okay. Uh, that's beautiful, yeah. Okay, so welcome back. And uh, as I'm shuffling through cards to find another category, um, can you name four people who have edited Isaac Asimov Science Fiction Magazine or even Asimov Science Fiction Magazine? Oh, oh good. Was, wow, Shorna McCarthy. Um, well, <laughs> Sheila Williams. Sheila. And the original editor, how can I, boy, who was the original editor of Urban. George Sithers. Yes. Yes. I was, just going through all the other things to refresh my mind. Uh, the other the early other, convention chair, right? Right. The other editor was Kathleen Maloney. What years did she edit? Uh, she edited 82 and 83. Okay. See, I cleverly put that on the card because I knew somebody would ask. Ah, you knew somebody would. I was ready to believe you just knew that. <laughs> it's true. You could have just made it up, and we all would have just been like, "Oh, but no, somebody watching would have written in and been like, Steven Silver gave you the wrong answer.' It yes. would be a scandal that rocked science fiction." Yes, and I, I do have people inform me when I give incorrect answers when I do this or trivia for chocolate. Um, Wait, there'll be no chocolate. Sorry, you know, I've tried. I haven't figured out how to throw it through the screen yet. <laughs> so. Trivia for chocolate can be fun, though. I uh, 
there was a few years ago, uh, one woman decided that the answer to every question that I asked was going to be Wilford Brimley. <laughs> and I promised her that Wilford Brimley was not an answer to any of the questions I had. And then when I turned it over to my wife, Elaine, to ask questions, I quickly Googled and found a question about Wilford Brimley. <laughs> Uh, and then they yelled at me that I had lied when I told them that there wasn't, but there hadn't been when I made that statement. The next year, I had a whole Wilford Brimley ca category, 25 questions about Wilford Brimley and science fiction films. The answer to none of them was Wilford Brimley. So, but now we're going to ask, 24 men have been to the moon and orbited around the moon or walking on the moon. Only three of them have gone twice. So, who's been to the moon twice? Buzz Aldrin? Once. Okay. Uh, Jim Lovell, for sure. Jim Lovell. Who, Apollo 8 and Apollo 13. Correct. Uh, John Young? John Young on Apollo 10 and 16. Go, mm. Bill, go. Go, Bill, go. <laughs> Did that artist go, Bean? I can't remember. Alan Bean? Uh, no. Alan Bean only went to the moon once. He also went up to Skylab. Okay. And I actually learned a really cool piece of trivia about him the other day, but let's see if you or if anybody or Bill can figure out who the third is. Hmm. For our only hope, Bill. Not, no, not Frank Borman. Um... Um, I don't really, I can't really do this. Eugene Chernin on Eugene 10 Chernin. and 17. Would not have had. So uh, okay. last, last weekend, I actually was on a uh, Zoom call with several of the Apollo astronauts' children. And uh, one of them was one of Alan Bean's daughters. And she explained, and this is just amazing. This is great. You know, Alan Bean, of course, is an amazing artist. But she explained that when the astronaut wives had to get all gussied up to go out to do an event, they would all go over to Alan Bean's house and he would do their hair and apply their fake eyelashes because, <laughs> because he was so precise in the placement of the eyelashes that it worked out really beautifully. And he also was really good at coming up with hairstyles for them. And I just now have this very different imp impression of Alan Bean, and I get to see him teasing all these women's hair in the 1960s. That's awesome. Uh, the other great comment was made by um, Neil Armstrong's son, who explained, they asked him, uh, did sons of astronauts have it more difficult than daughters? And he said, well, you know, the 1960s was a time when everybody, if you were a son, you were expected to do better than your father. And I just looked at my dad and thought, that ain't happening. <laughs> So um, a Doctor Who question. Um, I'm looking for the name of four actors who have played the master. Bill looks happy. No, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not smiling because I know the names of four actors who have played the ma master or even any actors who have played the master. But it really seems like the kind of saying, well, the, the experts that I'm on the panel with They'll catch this. They've all watched that. Oh, well, what's horrible is when you can see their faces in your head and you can't remember the dream that goes with the face. Can you just look in my head? Uh, okay, please? that one is correct. <laughs> the one next to it, I think that nose is a little bit too big. <laughs> I, I'm going to confess a really bad thing for a science fiction writer, which is that I have not watched a whole bunch of Doctor Who. That's okay. We could toss that question. And if it makes you feel any better, I can say the same about Star Trek. I think I watched... See, if you have Star Trek questions. Yeah. I think I have some Star Trek questions around Roll here somewhere. Star but, Trek. But before we get there, um, there are seven women who have been named Grandmaster by Sifwa. Can you, how many of them can you name? Well, CJ Cherry. Yes. Uh, Lois McMaster Rougeau. Yes. Didn't Kate Wilhelm get named? Uh, Kate Wilhelm has not, re oh, not received any names. Solstice. This is going to be terrible. I'll start tossing out names of people I thought 
Renee, Jane like Yolen. Carol Emswiller, but uh, Jane Yolen, yes, I believe Jane and uh, C.J. Cherry were both named Grandmaster by Cat Rambo. In yes, fact. So, oh. those was on was Anne McCaffrey, which surely had to be named. Anne McCaffrey was named in two thousand five. That was actually the first Nebula that I attended. Andre Norton. Yeah. Andre Norton was the first woman to be named. Ursula. Ursula was the second, and there's one other. Was Vonda? Vonda was not. No. Um, who else? Uh, Leigh Bracken? Connie. Pardon? Connie. Connie Willis. Connie Willis is the other one, yes. Nice going. So you got all seven of them. I would have, I would have accepted many fewer, actually. No, uh, never. <laughs> we celebrate the women. Well, and, and, and now uh, Mary Robinette. Or not Mary, sorry, I think president stuff. Cause right, I didn't ask about presidents. Yes, we could do a president question. That would be really in my um, Actually, I do have a similar type of question, but instead of asking for presidents of SIFWA, I ask for chairs of Worldcon. Uh, uh, but I don't think I'm going to go with that question here. About, Julian May. About, Julian okay. May. Julian May. Julia May was actually a Worldcon chair. Yes, she was the first female Worldcon chair. Nice. Um, in Chicago at uh, ShyCon 2. Well, right, surely right Peggy, Peggy Ray must have. Uh, Peggy Ray chaired uh, the 1998 Worldcon in Baltimore. I got one. My, fir my first Worldcon. Pardon? Dave Kyle. Dave Kyle was not a woman. Oh, you, oh I, well, I didn't hear the word woman. <laughs> I thought you just wanted us to list every Worldcon chair. He so. didn't exactly ask the question. No, no, that, that question just kind of came up spur of the moment. Oh, and, okay. You know. How many women, Stephen, have been chairs of Worldcon? Uh, I'd have to sit down and count. Um, I mean, Kathleen okay. Meyer, uh, Helen Montgomery is, a, is going to be a chair. Uh, there's, you know, Karen Meschke, thank you. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of a lot of women have, especially in more recent years, um, some of them co-chairing. So uh, that'll be a question for a future version. Um, okay. Tell us more of Worldcon history, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different panel. <laughs> <laughs> You're just trying to avoid answering questions. <laughs> My nefarious scheme has been uncovered. <laughs> okay, which science fiction author coined the term robotics? Kurt, well, robotics or robot? Robotics. Oh, so we're not, not talking about Carl Kopeck here. We're, we're talking. And I, I think that was Asimov, wasn't it? It was right. Asimov. You're right. And actually, Scott, Carol Kopeck did not coin the term robot. His I know, his father, brother did. So, um, isn't it his brother? Am I right? Yeah, it is his brother. It's just yeah. Carol's the one who published first. Yeah. So, um, who coined the term Ansible? Sorry? Ursula Le Guin. Ursula Le Guin. Really? That's yes. cool. Pan Galactic. That's Fargo Blaster? Adams. It is Wait, not no. actually. It is oh. not actually Douglas Adams. It predates. Oh, him. Pan Galactic without the Gargle Blaster. Yes. Pan Galactic. Pan hey, Galactic. Doc Smith. Yeah, that sounds like a Doc Smith. It is much later than Doc Smith. Mm -hmm. Pan Galactic was coined by Jack Chalker. Uh, how about Terraform? Well, that's Jack Williamson. That is of Jack course. Williamson, yes. Okay, um, I am now looking for you guys to name actors who have appeared in both DC and Marvel universes. Actors? Actors. Actors? Actors. Like, like human beings instead of fictional characters? Like human Wait, beings, what? right. Like for, for instance, uh, Zachary Levi appeared as one of the Warriors 3 in the Thor movies, and he appeared as Shazam in Shazam. So he's appeared in both DC and Marvel universes. This is going to be hard, folks. Rough going. I'll settle for two. If you give us one, then you will settle for one. <laughs> Come on, Scott, you, you wrote for both DC and Marvel. You should oh, be right on this. I, I should know. Uh, Ryan Reynolds. Oh, Ryan yeah, Reynolds yeah. did. He appear, appeared as Green Lantern and Deadpool. Yep. So Bravo, Scott. <laughs> well done, Ryan, Mr. Edelman. Ryan Reynolds. Uh, Do you know Ryan Reynolds, Scott? 
I do not, but I, I've met Gemma Chan, who played Dr. Minerva, the character I created in 1977 with artist Al Milgram, who appeared in the Captain Marvel movie last year. Oh, that's so cool. That's as close as I get. That's pretty close. That is, yeah, that's very close, I think. I think it's pretty cool that one of your characters made it onto the big screen that way. Oh, it was a man. And also that she turned out to be a very nice person when I, when I met her. Jeez. You should give him credit for that, even if yeah. you don't know Okay. Him. Okay. We um, should get like extra like rambliness points or just like, I don't know. Oh, well, you know, ramble away, ramble away. Okay. Uh, are we, are we ready for more puns? Sure. I am. Okay, so now, Bill, I'm not sure that you're allowed to play this game because I believe we played it the last time when you were on. Oh, oh okay. I'll recuse but, myself. But, then. but you, but you know, on the other hand, you may not remember any of the answers. So, um, you remember the 1960s Batman <laughs> and how campy it was. So I'm going to give you um, descriptions of potential Batman characters, okay, or villains. And each of these potential Batman villains, their names are a pun on an actual Batman villain. Okay? Okay. So, a Batman villain who, strang who smiles while he strangles you. The Choker. That is correct. Good Very one. good, Kat. Okay, and um, how about a Batman who taunts, a villain who taunts Batman with pancakes? Griddler? Very good. Oh, oh, good. Nicely done. Okay. Um, let's see. How about a Batman villain who has had hot soup splashed on his face? Oh, 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 oh. It's not two face. It's uh, soup. Soup face? Face. Yeah. No. What? what, what? I bet that, that's keep, close, but no. Keep working it. Hot soup. Mm. Stew face. Oh, stew face. <laughs> <Stew. laughs> okay, okay. okay. Um, and um, how about a villain who drives his victim insane by looking at them? Let's see. Can't, I think I'm penguin related. Uh, we could just run through some villains. Uh. That's a good way to start. <laughs> yeah, I even watched them twice. Once with myself, once with my kids. Let's see. We've got Catwoman. Uh, we've got. Uh... Trouble is, I keep thinking of Flash villains. So, yeah. Bill, do do any of these sound familiar to you, or have we just demonstrated that you have a yeah, bad memory? They, they all they all sound familiar. The the last one, um, I can't remember what what answer we came up with, if we did. So, so how about the Starecrow? Oh, oh the uh, Starecrow. <laughs> that's, okay. that's weak. <laughs> Sorry, they, they can't all be bad. Okay, um, which Star Wars actor technically has an EGOT, although the Oscar that this person won is in some of them may be in non competitive honorary fields awards. So, a Star Wars actor who has an EGOT. What is an EGOT? Uh, they have won an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. Oh. John Williams? No, he's not an actor, of course. He just did music. Just. I'm with Let's see. Alec Guinness? Mm -hmm. See, Karen everybody Fisher. thinks everybody goes to Alec Guinness, but it's it's not him. He's probably won real Oscars. Mark Hamill. Wait, you said one of them is a non-competitive category that therefore would be honorary. Yes, for this person. But Broadway mm -hmm. recording, singing, musicianship somehow, and um, uh, and uh, yeah, and and Emmy and, and television. Uh, golly. Let's see. I don't remember Harrison Ford doing any Broadway work, so I don't think it would be. 
Carrie Fisher? Uh, James Earl Jones. James Earl ah. Jones. So now, now we do have two more questions in this category. So the next question is. When we do so well at. Yes. A, there's a Star Trek actor who has won all competitive EGOTs. Sorry, the question is, who is it? Star Trek actor. I guess we can't narrow it down by which Trek. Um, um, next gen. Okay. Patrick Stewart? Nope. Renee Bourgeois. Nope, both good guesses. Is it Brent Spiner? It is not. Ha! Is it LeVar Burton? No. Oh. I was really just... It's actually Whoopi Goldberg. Oh! oh. Uh, of course uh, it is. Not on the bridge. You just don't think. I and guess I think you run into the officers, right? And then the final one, one of us, there's one EGOT winner who not only has won the Emmy, the Grammy, the Oscar, and the Tony, but has also won the Hugo and the Nebula. <laughs> so there's one Negoth winner. It's not Catherine Isaro, no. I don't think Catherine has won an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Upstanding. or Tony. Oh, I'm just kind of working with what I got. <laughs> it's kind of it's superstar who's known for. I'm guessing this is for dramatic performance. Is it for screenwriting? Yes, it would be. Hey, well, be screenwriting. Some of them would be for screenwriting. Is it David yeah. Gerald? It is not David Gerald. Neil Gaiman. Ooh, good guess. But Broadway? I don't think so. Ellison? You're, you're actually on the wrong track. Oh, you're, you're thinking yeah. of oh, authors oh. within our community. Oh. That's really not the way you want to be it's thinking. Is it Janice Ian? Oh. Ooh, Janice is a good guess, but she has is, she is not won a, a Nebula or, a, or a Hugo. It's a big time showbiz person who also got some science fiction awards. It's Probably for a very beloved uh, uh, movie or TV show of some kind. You are very much on the right track. Oh, uh, is it, it? I'm just walking down the logical path here. Even Spielberg or someone like that. No, That's the only thing I'm trying to. Hmm. Is it George? It's not George. Uh, if, 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 okay, if it helps, a comedy record, right? if it helps, this person won their Nebula and Hugo in the early seventies. Ray Bradbury. No. Oh, Ray Bradbury is a nice guess. Is it Bradbury? Bradbury? It is Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Right. He he won a Nebula and a Hugo for Young Frankenstein. But though, was that technically a nebula? Because wasn't that a Bradbury? Award? No, the, the Bradbury uh, was created later. Uh, uh, in, in the early years, Bradbury was like a Lifetime Achievement Award. It switched over to being voted like a nebula in 2009. Um, and then, of course, now okay. it is a nebula. But back mm -hmm. in, the, in the early 70s, for like three or four years, they were giving out nebulas for screenwriters. Mel Brooks won it for uh, Young Frankenstein. Woody Allen won it for Sleeper. Um, I think one other one might have been given out. Did any of them then come to the ceremony? Um, Brooks didn't. Alan didn't. Um, I don't think so. I don't oh, think good. so. Why do we give them awards? <laughs> so we give them awards so that we can feel better about ourselves. Um, okay, so we are running close to time. Uh, Karen, how much time do I have left? I've been told they will kill you if you go over the 50 minute mark, Stephen. Yeah. They've said Karen will hunt you down. Five uh, minutes. Okay. I just threw you off. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go back to uh, some questions about women. Um, who is the first woman to have won uh, a Hugo Award for fiction? CJ Cherry? No. Five minutes. Uh, Hugo Award for Fiction. 
Oh, 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 oh. Okay. the list. Do this. Tip three. Uh... Anne McCaffrey. Anne McCaffrey won for uh, Wear Search in 1968. Uh, 1968. Wow. It took that long, huh? It took that long. Uh, and what about the first woman to win a Hugo for Best Novel? Was that CJ? No. No. That's probably Ursula Le Guin. That is know. Ursula Le Guin in 1970 for Left Hand of Darkness. Left Hand of Darkness. <laughs> uh, best Short Story. 1974 is the year. Wilhelm? Uh, no, not Kate. Tip three. Let's throw out names that we know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lee Brackett. No, it's my turn. Le Guin and Butler. Yeah, Tip Tree is not a bad guess. Was it Vonda McIntyre? No, it was also Ursula. Also oh. Ursula. Okay. That was for uh, one, the one who walks away from Amalus. Oh, such a good story. So, and the first. You should go read that immediately. And the, the first woman to win a Hugo for Best Novelette in 1978. Tip Tree. No. Um, that's more nebula material. Let's see. Um, Joan Vinge? Yes, for uh, Eyes of Amber. Nice. Got- well done, Bill. So the, the, the four first women to win the nebula in each category were 69, Kate Wilhelm for short story, and Anne McCaffrey for novella. 1970, Ursula Le Guin for uh, uh, Left Hand of Darkness. And 1974 was Van- Vonda McIntyre for Of Mist and Grass and Sand. Mm. Love that. Okay, uh, f- so probably the last category here. Uh, I'm looking for names of spaceships. Now, these are fictional spaceships, okay? So um, what is the name of a spaceship name for a rental car agency? Bill just has Inter- this like... Enter- Enterprise is correct. Oh, but I I think I remember this question from before. Okay, okay gotcha. Okay, and uh, what about a type of spaceship uh, name for Groucho Marx character? I, I'm gonna pass because I remember this okay. one too. Um, Groucho's birthday, by the way, was yesterday. I uh, guess Captain Spaulding was not a spaceship. Yeah, yeah. No, but Firefly was. Ah, Rufus T. Firefly Rufus, from yes. Duck Soup. Um, how about a spacecraft name for a very sunburned Gimli? Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf is correct. Um, what about a spacecraft that rode a Pegasus? Pegasus. Wasn't it Jason that rode? No. Bill, do you know this one? Do you remember it? Uh, no, I, 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 I guess I don't. Uh, <laughs> Heracles is this is the, the Bellerophon from uh, oh. the Forbidden Planet. Okay. So, and, and and Scott, I'm going to put you on the spot because this one is. Oh no, weird. no, no! Don't please. What What would Stan Lee's favorite spacecraft be called? <laughs> Excelsior! That is right. The Excelsior Yay. is from a 1918 film called A Trip to Mars. Thank you. I think we're about to get booted down. I, uh, so, and I think that that takes us to the end of time. I would like to thank my panelists. I hope you all had a good time. The end of time. Thank you, Stephen. This has been a lot of fun. I, I was worried. I was like, oh my God, he's going to torture us. He did an amazing job. It's he's supposed to be fun for everybody. So I would like to thank all of our audience for joining us. I hope you also had a good time. Um, I found that this is a great uh, thing to do on these virtu- virtual conventions and Hope to do some more of them. Um, So again, thank you all for coming and thank you for participating.